Hello, and welcome to week two of International Human Rights Law, Prospects and Challenges. Today, I'll provide a brief overview of the topics that we'll be discussing in week two, and then we'll turn to the first of those topics, civil and political rights. So first, an overview of what we'll talk about this week. We'll begin with a discussion of civil and political rights, and in particular, an introduction to the main human rights treaty on that topic, the ICCPR. We'll also talk about, in particular, the right to life and capital punishment, and conclude with a discussion of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. We then turn to a discussion of women's rights with, first, an overview of some of the key challenges and issues in the women's rights area, then an introduction to the Convention on All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW, and an evaluation of that treaty. We'll conclude week two with a discussion of economic, social, and cultural rights, the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, the challenges to this, this category of rights and the responses to those challenges, and finally, a case study on the right to health and South Africa. Let's begin today's class with the following overview. We will talk first about what civil and political rights are. We'll review the civil and political rights that we've seen in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. We'll then analyze the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights with a specific example of the right to life. So let's get started with uh, a, a brief discussion of these different categories of rights. Civil rights, as generally defined, are rights that restrict abusive or repressive conduct on the part of governments and their agents or officials. Classic examples include the rights to life, liberty, and equality. Political rights, by contrast, enable citizens to participate in the political process and the process of governance. Well-known examples are the right to universal suffrage or voting and freedom of association. Now it's worth noting that these two categories of rights are not entirely distinct. There can be considerable overlap between them. For example, freedom of speech is very often used, uh, which is a civil right, is very often used uh, to criticize governments or elections. So in that sense, it touches on both categories of rights. Now, an important distinction that I now want to introduce is the one between so-called negative liberties and positive obligations. Civil and political rights are overwhelmingly negative liberties. These are rights that can be respected if the government concerned refrains from acting. So, for example, if police officers don't use coercive in interrogation measures, uh, or if uh, state officials refrain from engaging in extrajudicial killing, uh, then the rights to be free from torture and the right to life will be respected. Conversely, uh, there are some civil and political rights that impose or implicate positive obligations by the state and require affirmative measures uh, in order to satisfy those rights. So uh, a good example is the right to a fair and impartial hearing or trial. That requires states to set up independent courts. Now I'll preview a little bit what we'll talk about with respect to economic, social, and cultural rights. Those rights are predominantly positive obligations, but they do have uh, negative rights or negative liberties implications. So civil and political rights, mainly negative liberties, but some affirmative obligations. And we'll discuss that issue more in a moment. For now, I want to just highlight for you those legal instruments that protect civil and political rights. There's the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which we've discussed. There are numerous UN human rights treaties, regional human rights treaties, and national constitutions. So these are a set of rights that are very widely respected both nationally uh, and, in, and uh, internationally. Here's a brief uh, reminder of some of the civil and political rights that we've seen in the UDHR. Again, most of these are negative liberties. 
Now remember, the UDHR was a non-binding statement of principles, and one of the steps that was taken by the United Nations Commission on Human Rights after the adoption of the UDHR was the drafting of an, a binding international agreement on internationally protected human rights. With respect to civil and political rights, this drafting process led to the adoption of the ICCPR. It was finalized as an international agreement in 1966. It became effective in 1976 after the requisite number of states had ratified the agreement. And currently it has 167 states parties. And I've given you a link to the full text of the agreement. Now what does the ICCPR do that the Universal Declaration does not? Well first, as I mentioned just a moment ago, the ICCPR is a legally binding international instrument for those states that have ratified it. There are other things that the ICCPR does as well. So it protects nearly all of the civil and political rights that are in the UDHR, but it defines them with greater precision and it creates international monitoring mechanisms. And I've given you an example of the right to life, which you can see as a very short statement in the UDHR and a slightly more elaborate developed statement in the ICCPR. That's one example of uh, defining a right with greater precision or specificity. In addition, uh, international monitoring mechanisms known as uh, UN treaty bodies are also created by the ICCPR. And in particular, the United Nations Human Rights Committee is established by the ICCPR to monitor the implementation of the treaty by its states parties. As we'll discuss in more detail in the third week of the course, states parties submit reports describing uh, their implementation of the Covenant or ICCPR and the Human Rights Committee reviews their reports and issues concluding observations and recommendations. And based in part on the experience that the committee develops in this reporting process, the committee comes up with so-called general comments that provide guidance to all states parties and that interpret some of the key terms in the ICCPR. And we're going to now talk about one of those uh, general comments and how it has interpreted the right to life protected in Article 6 of the ICCPR. So here again is a brief statement of the first paragraph of Article 6 uh, on the right to life. Every human being has the inherent right to life, which shall be protected by law, and no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his life. We will come back to some of these key phrases in a moment, but for now I simply want to highlight for you that in 1982, the Human Rights Committee adopted a general comment on this uh, article. And I would refer you to these general comments as excellent sources of guidance for interpreting protected rights and freedoms. And they're quite good at providing additional context and understanding of terms that might otherwise be seen as ambiguous um, or vague. So here's an example. So the provision we just looked at, Article 6.1, refers to the inherent right to life. And you might be wondering, what's the significance from a legal perspective of describing the right to life as inherent? Well, General Comment 6 explains that. It says that this phrase should not be understood in a restrictive way, and it implies positive measures or positive obligations. And here you see a statement of the Human Rights Committee saying uh, that states' parties should do certain things to affirmatively promote life as well as taking uh, negative steps or refraining from action uh, to respect that right. And some of those positive steps that the committee refers to are reducing infant mortality, increasing life expectancy, uh, and uh, adopting measures to reduce or eliminate malnutrition and epidemics. 
So here you see how the word inherent has been interpreted as including not just a negative liberty, but also a positive obligation. Here's another example, again from Article 6.1, the reference to arbitrary deprivations of life as being prohibited. Well, what does it mean to say that states must undertake to prevent these arbitrary deprivations? Here again, the general comment provides some guidance, and the committee has taken the view that states' parties are required not only to prevent and punish deprivations or takings of life uh, by uh, criminal acts, but also to prevent such arbitrary killings by their own security forces. Uh, therefore, in their national laws, the states' parties to the ICCPR must limit and control the circumstances in which a person may be deprived of his or her life by governmental authorities. So again, this is uh, some additional guidance on what a specific word in a treaty means, and from that we can deduce a set of state practices that give us even more information. And we'll see more examples of that uh, as we go through the course. For now, I will leave you with a slide with some additional information. And if you click on the PDF file on the Coursera webpage for this lecture, you'll be able to access these additional sources.